What's going on peeps, and today we will be discussing an artist I never thought I would have to, Melanie Martinez. I first heard about her in 2016 when Crybaby was a major success in the alternative scene. I would hear several snippets of her songs through music channels I would watch, but after that year, I feel like I never heard of her again. I was more of a Toy and Pilots guy during that period, but following her return this year after three years of musical inactivity, she landed on my radar again, especially after my good friend Brad Tasted Music started viewing her music and getting in a huge beef with her fanbase. Now, don't click off the video. I know he didn't like her stuff, but I myself never gave it a chance before. So, I decided to give her discography a shot, and... It's not my thing. But that's okay, music is subjective, and doing this deep dive into the mystery of Melanie, I found some elements about her artistry that make me understand why she has so many fans in the first place. And today, I'll be discussing those elements in this video. The appeal of Melanie Martinez. Melanie was born on April 28, 1995 in Astoria, Queens, New York. Growing up, she was inspired by artists such as Brandy, Britney Spears, Shakira, The Beatles, Tupac, Biggie, and Christina Aguilera. She had a destiny in mind of becoming a famous singer. Martinez went to Plaza Elementary School and credits Mr. Naden, one of her teachers, for teaching her how to sing. She also started composing poems while she was in kindergarten. Because she was very emotional and found it difficult to articulate her thoughts, people used the term crybaby to describe her as a youngster due to their emotional nature, which went on to inspire the development of the character for her debut album, Crybaby. In order to kick off her musical journey, she needed to get recognized for her talent. Her first option was the MSG Varsity Talent Show, however she was eliminated after the second round. Despite this setback, she didn't give up. Martinez first gained fame as a contestant on the reality TV show The Voice during its third season in 2012. The first untelevised audition took place at Jada's Center as an open call. Her mother's car broke down before they arrived at Queen's Midtown Tunnel, forcing the two to hitchhike a taxi to get to the audition. She learned she had made it to the second round, and was eventually chosen to appear in the show's audition. Martinez sang Toxic by Britney Spears at her audition. Adam Levine, CeeLo Green, and Blake Shelton pressed the I want you button on her behalf. Martinez ended up selecting the GOAT Adam Levine as her mentor. Martinez faced Caitlin Michelle in the battle round. They sang Lights by Ellie Golden as a duet. Martinez prevailed and advanced to the knockout stage. Sam James and Martinez were placed together for another knockout round. She performed Bulletproof by La Rocks. Martinez would advance to the live round after Levine eliminated James. Martinez would sing Hit the Road Jack in week one. Then, Martinez was picked up by Levine to compete in week three with her cover of the Seven Nation Army, which would reach the iTunes top ten. In week four, her cover of Too Close allowed her to finish in sixth place during the voting round. However, during week five, Martinez was eliminated by audience vote. In reaction, Martinez remarked, This is beyond anything I could have ever imagined. I never expected to get this far. The final objective was to truly touch people's hearts. So I'm really happy that I was able to do that. Although she was eliminated in the later rounds, her unique style and distinctive voice caught the attention of the audience and music industry professionals. She would begin working on her own music and released her debut EP titled Dollhouse in 2014. Additionally, Martinez published a music video for the title track, which was fan-funded through an Indiegogo website she set up. Friends of hers handled the hair, makeup, and filming for the video. It became a sleeper hit and garnered millions of views on YouTube. On April 7, 2014, 2014, Martinez signed to Atlantic Records and announced that she would tour. With a major label by her side and a small fan base waiting, it was time to roll out her debut album. On June 1st, 2015, Martinez put out Pity Party, which samples Leslie Gore's It's My Party in the chorus. It was a big deal in the alternative scene. Her debut studio album was released on August 14th, titled Cry Baby. The album expanded on the themes of childhood and struggles of growing up, drawing inspiration from her own experiences. It was a commercial success, reaching number 6 on the Billboard 200 to 41,000 units first week. It wanted to go two times platinum in the States. Her visual style and storytelling abilities became essential to her artistic expression. She often incorporates elements of fantasy, childhood imagery, and dark themes in her music videos and performances. 
voices. This distinctive visual identity helped her stand out in the pop music landscape and gained her a dedicated fan base. Every song from the album has been certified gold or higher. To follow up such a smash record was a task, so she knew she had to take her time with her follow up record. Martinez revealed in 2017 her desire to create a film that tells a story of each song for her second album, explaining, I'm writing a film right now. I'm going to spend a year on it, directing it, shooting it, makeup and everything, so it's a lot of work. On May 15th, 2019, Martinez released the album's first teaser trailer, revealing the title, K-12. The album was released on September 6th, right around school time. The film, which I plan to talk about later, was available in select theaters across the world. She also posted the film to YouTube. K-12 continued to explore themes of childhood and societal issues, using the concept of a fictional school as a backdrop for the narrative. It debuted at number 3, selling 57,000 units in the first week. She would put the After School EP, which isn't connected to the K-12 in terms of storyline, it's pretty much the deluxe. There were several complications with this one due to the COVID-19 pandemic. With this release out of the way, Martinez disappeared. Until February 18, 2023, she archived all of her Instagram posts and teased her third studio album, Portals, by posting an Instagram video of a mushroom in a foggy, dreamy forest with R.I.P. Crybaby carved into its stem and a snippet of the new song. Over the next few days, several other snippets were posted on all of her social media accounts with themes of rebirth. On February 22nd, she uploaded a teaser of herself hatching from an egg as a pink fairy of sorts. Some sorts. It ended with an announcement of her third album. On March 17th, Death was released as its lead single from the album. Martinez performed at Lollapalooza 2023 to promote the record. On March 31st, Portals was released. It became her highest sales week yet, debuting at number 2 with 142,000 units. She's now preparing to tour the record in the summer and likely to release several visuals as usual. Okay, now that you know where it rise, let's get into why people enjoy her stuff. It makes sense to start with the reason people discovered her in the first place, her voice. You see, she's got an expressive, emotional vocal tone that can surely sell the story she is going for. She's been compared to Lord and Lana Del Rey with her whispery but also furious inflection. You can tell by the way she uses her voice that the story being told is pretty damn real. The mezzo-soprano range she has allows her to hit some good high notes and also put on a good baby voice, which I guess works in context with the crybaby storyline. My only worry is being that she might be straining her voice a bit. The damages are clear on the after school EP. That could be just due to the effects of touring which can leave your vocals fragile if you don't use a good technique. It did recover over quarantine but it could still happen again. What I'm trying to say is that as a vocalist, Melanie is good at selling emotion that connects with her audience who will easily be able to feel the pain and anguish as she performs. I can clearly see how she's attracted the audience she has after her time in The Voice. It really depends on how Martinez uses her voice, because when it's used right, it creates some of her most memorable performances to date. High School Sweethearts, Recess, Mrs. Potato Head come to mind. The Scream on Pity Party was pretty unexpected as well. I can admire that she gives it her all vocally, even if it might be hurting her. On the production end of things, this is where it starts getting weird. The beats are sprinkled with hip hop inspired instrumentation along with some strange child sounding effects accompanied by babyish pianos, music boxes, and toys. This is a big part of the crybaby sound. I find myself respecting how everything seems to be going along with the theme of the record. And I would probably find these sounds seemingly out of place in like any other record. Obviously you get some pretty keyboard melodies and sinister sounding bass lines. It's giving me this innocent, nothing wrong going on here, and then this evil, everything sucks here kind of vibe. I will say, it is interesting to explore and analyze. I don't feel like the production is boring at all. K-12 follows a similar formula, but I feel like some of the awkward clunky moments in the rhythm are polished up a bit. If anything, I kind of admire how messy it is. Intentional or not, it matches this nervous, anxious undertone of the lyrics where everything seems be falling apart. I'll always respect an artist for trying something different and not playing it safe. It makes for a good conversation. Her latest record, Portals, takes a detour from this childlike sound for more experimental territory in pop rock and art pop. It definitely serves as the most refined production she's had. Void is a pop radio ready track that I can see being pushed if she were to try. That's the thing, a lot of songs she has 
even if they have great hooks, they might be a bit too weird and risky for the radio. Pity Party is the only other song that has made it to pop radio. Maybe that's why I think it's their best song, it just sounds the cleanest out of her catalog in every way. But Melly doesn't need the radio to promote her stuff. It seems like no matter what she puts out, her diehard fanbase will eat it up anyway. Look at the streams y'all. Getting a bit off topic, but I'll finish off by saying her production is just another piece to put together this chaotic, weird nature of her sound. Now let's talk about the lyrics she presents to us. On first listen, they likely won't make sense. For me it didn't. She's got a way of stringing strange metaphors together that require more than just a half-assed listen. They don't appear to be that simple. This all connects with some type of lore, which we will get into. I do think the overarching theme is part nursery and part tragedy. Just like a nursery rhyme, her songs are pretty dang catchy. Like after that movie, I just couldn't stop singing show in to like bro she put crack in that song on the surface you'll see a childish title like mrs potato head accompanied by some rather bright sounding melodies until you dig into the lyrics and realize it's a song about the risks of plastic surgery insisting that even if pretty hurts you probably shouldn't start cutting and pasting because you might regret trying to make yourself into something you're not it's a sweet message that doesn't attack women for getting plastic surgery. It's more of a, why are you doing this when you're beautiful without it? It's a positive message and I respect it. Carousel doesn't have a happy ending though. Once again, a carousel sounds exciting and fun when you see the title. It even starts with a circus sounding symphline. But it's really about falling in love with someone and being stuck in the same ride trying to catch them but never reaching them. The carousel is just a metaphor for a love that will never happen no matter how many times you try. Oh yeah, and she cusses a lot so playing this around your child wouldn't be a good idea either way. Her songs use childhood themes as metaphors for real life issues including alcoholic parents, kidnapping, and domestic violence. I'm sure there are good intentions with the art, but I get why people are skeptical. This is going to be a big section because I myself love a good mystery and lore to an artist. It just makes for good entertainment and it allows you to seem more connected to their work. Just look at Toil and Pilots. The melody mystery starts with her alter ego known as Crybaby or Melatonin. Her physical features include brown hair and two different colored braids inspired by Cruel de Vel. Brown eyes and a gap between her front two teeth. As heard for the Dollhouse EP, Crybaby's family consisted of her older brother, mother, and father. Shortly after Crybaby was born, her mother called her a Crybaby because she cried too loudly. Her brother then writes Crybaby on her birth certificate, taking her mother's comment a bit too literally. When Crybaby's mother tries to feed her at home, she throws a tantrum and hallucinates the toys attacking her. That night, Crybaby is worried, but so is her mother, who catches her husband with another woman. She ties them both up and stabs them to death while they're drunk. When Crybaby investigates the dead bodies of her father and lover, her mother drugs her using a sippy cup to make her forget what she saw. Crybaby later enters a relationship with a boy she meets at a carnival, whom she later names Alphabet Boy. The relationship is one-sided and constantly makes Crybaby feel like she will never get over love. Crybaby realizes that this relationship is toxic and breaks up with him. She wants to prove to him how tough she is and becomes aggressive, attacking his household item with a knife, hoping she will see him. She later meets another boy but is incredibly nervous about interacting with him. She says a lot of embarrassing things. Oh, that's it. I said too much. It overflowed. Why do I always spill? She's afraid to say she loves him if he doesn't love her back. Crybaby and a boy named Johnny form a relationship, and Crybaby decides to take the relationship to the next level, aka taking off their training wheels. But Crybaby throws a birthday party where no one shows up, including Johnny. This causes her to destroy her house in a senseless rampage, which she later regrets. What a pity. She breaks up with Johnny. Now alone, she goes out shopping, and an ice cream truck appears outside. The cashier seems to take this as a bad omen and she gives her a bottle of poison as she leaves. 
She stops by an ice cream truck that's driven by a wolf, likely a metaphor for her camouflage predators. The wolf drugs her with ice cream and drives off with her. The wolf tells Crybaby to make her milk and cookies to escape. She uses the poison the cashier gave her and poisons the cookies. After escaping, Crybaby tries to invite a friend. Her friend, Blue Boy, is in a relationship with a girl Crybaby calls Basic Bitch. Crybaby notes that Blue Boy does not seem happy and decides to please him. She she fails after basic bitch apparently has bigger breasts. She is now aware that attractive bodies have a great influence on boys and becomes self-conscious. After seeing many beauty commercials on TV, she believes that her hair must be a different color, she must be skinnier, and she must have bigger breasts to be loved. But after seeing a Mrs. Potato Head horror story, she realizes that she is perfect just the way she is and doesn't need a change. She tries smoking and drinking, causing her to hallucinate people with completely dark eyes standing around her bed. She passes out and has a dream that represents her self-reflection and how she learned to love herself despite being a little cuckoo. She also has powers like chronokinesis and telekinesis. I find this story to be pretty uplifting. She is this young, sensitive girl in a troubled household, and because of her emotional nature, she was constantly mocked and teased. She was an insecure person prone to violent tantrums. However, as the story progresses, she grows as a person, gradually learning to overcome her struggles with faith and learns what it means to be a happy person. Not everybody grows up in a good place and has several demons because of it, but it is satisfying to fight through it all and become happy. However, Beery Human and Crybaby doesn't seem to be. She's what we call an empath. She can't die, but rather reincarnates. Her body wears out over time, but her soul remains intact, except for the memories of her past life. She learns from experiences depicted in songs, music videos, storybooks, tours, and more. She is an all-powerful being who transcends reality. This is starting to sound like a movie with these visuals and storytelling. Hmm, how about that? <laughs> I think the idea for a movie is awesome. I like when an artist attempts to broadcast their artistic vision on the big screen instead of just through some audio. I watched the entire K-12 movie on YouTube. Here's a summary. Crybaby gets sent to a boarding school called K-12 Sleepaway School with her best friend Angelita. On the bus ride to K-12, Crybaby is bullied by the other students for the gap between her two front teeth. It turns out that she and Angelita have psychic powers likely obtained from that potion in Mad Hatter. The girls use their powers to prank the students, but it ends up distracting the bus driver and ends up falling into a lake. The girls lift the bus from the water into the sky before landing at K-12. Crybaby and Angelita arrive late to Miss Daphne's class and are scolded by her. You must be at your designated place when the bell rings. In class, Crybaby and a boy named Brandon become friends, but his girlfriend Kelly gets jealous. She believes that Crybaby and Brandon are flirting and writes a disturbing letter to Crybaby saying, You at recess, accompanied by a stick person lying next to a tombstone threatening. During nap time, Crybaby shows Angelita she expresses concern that she has no chance of winning because she doesn't know how to fight, to which Angelita advises her to use her powers. She refuses, claiming it would be cheating. During recess, Brandon decides to play with Angelita and Crybaby, causing Kelly to become aggressive with Crybaby and cuts her with a knife. Crybaby hovers and tries to strangle Kelly with her braids. When this happens, Miss Daphne sees what is happening and stops the fight. They are sent to the principal's office. While waiting for the meeting, Crybaby learns from another child that the principal is forcing the students to take pills to prevent them from leaving the school. An angry Crybaby uses their powers to call the principal anonymously and insult him, telling him everything he has done wrong. She uses her powers to poison him and escapes the office. Meanwhile, Miss Daphne finds the dying principal and orders the bunny doctors to heal him. Crybaby arrives late to class and as punishment, Miss Penelope turns her into a doll and makes her dance only to accidentally drop and break the doll. Miss Penelope takes her to the nurse's office and Angelita, who is on her way to class, sees Crybaby and transforms her into a human. The nurses try to keep the duo contained and under control until an angelic spirit guide named Lilith frees Crybaby and Angelita. In drama class, Crybaby is forced to play a role she doesn't like, leading to events like pressing a hot iron into another student's face. He then warns the students in the auditorium that they are being brainwashed and uses their powers to subdue the guards and free the students. 
At Crybaby's command, the students rush into the principal's office and begin the tearing him apart and killing him. They bury the body, and then they go play tennis with their friend, Celeste, who is revealed to have the same powers as the girls. Crybaby then has a dream where she talks to Lilith and tells her that she wants no part of that world. At lunch, Kelly and her friends try to get Crybaby to spread gossip, but Crybaby leaves and meets Magnolia, a girl with the same powers as her group. Crybaby and friends soon discover that Kelly Kelly's friend Flair has the same powers as them and start a food fight to separate her from the group. After seeing Flair leave with Kelly, Crybaby follows her into the bathroom where she discovers that Flair is bulimic due to Kelly's pressure to maintain a certain figure. Crybaby tells Flair that everyone deserves love and they become friends. Leo, the headmaster's son, stops the food fight and asks who is responsible for the situation. Kelly tells him that Crybaby was the one who started it, for which reason she was sent to detention. During detention, the nurse Nurses inject students with drugs to brainwash them into doing more homework, but Crybaby hypnotizes Leo into letting her go. Crybaby finds an anonymous letter in her locker containing a poem from another student confessing his feelings. The friends discuss a plan to take out Leo and free the school, unaware that he is watching for the security cameras. In biology class, the teacher who works with Leo flirts with Angelita and invites her to stay after class. Later, he gives Angelita a poisoned lollipop that shrinks her, tries to cut her in half, but Crybaby hears Angelita's pleas for help. She enters the room and uses telekinesis to throw him against the wall, turns Angelita back to normal size with mental reintegration, and kills the teacher with his own knife. The next day, Leo asks Crybaby to the school dance, which she accepts, thinking, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. He claims to be the one who wrote the love letter as poor Ben listens behind a lie. During the dance, Crybaby hatched a plan to free K-12 by accepting Leo's offer. Her friends were disappointed and she rushed to the bathroom. Leo informs the students that he knew what she was planning and forces all the students to dance for hours. Crybaby, disguised as a woman called Lorelei, locks Leo in a closet and frees everyone from the spell. She warns the students to leave the school. Crybaby then meets Ben, who confesses to her that he was the one who put the note on her locker. Together, they patch a plan using a bubble to make the school float and disappear. Once this is done, they both jump off the balcony to escape. Their plan is a success, and Crybaby kisses Ben on the cheek. Lilic reappears with the gate to return home. As Angelita has entered the gate, she stops and asks Crybaby if she is coming or not. Crybaby looks back in shock, and the movie ends. Overall, it was a decent movie. I thought the visuals were great, the performance were pretty good for the most part. I'm not much of a film critic, I don't watch a lot of movies honestly. My issues came down to the pacing and parts of the story. There were a couple of transitions between scenes like Drama Club to the Strawberry Shortcake scene that just felt like it was jumping way too far ahead without reason. I thought the story mostly made sense in the context of the music. The high school sweetheart scene seemed like filler though. There was also some unnecessary political commentary that seemed a bit tryhard and didn't do anything to really build up the storyline. The movie did teach us more about the Crybaby lore, including some new powers, and that love story between Crybaby and Ben was rather cute. It gives us an ending that suggests a sequel, which I'm guessing will be explained in the portals rollout. If you're a fan, watch it. If you're not, probably not in your best interest. But speaking of the fans... I enjoy Melody's music because it makes me feel something. I've been listening to their music on and off over the years, but this new album just hits different because I've had it on repeat for weeks. Their music allows me to be vulnerable and able to confront what I'm feeling. It makes it easier for me to confront how I feel when I know others are fighting the same battles as I am. I also love how she tells stories in her songs. I just love reading the lyrics and deciphering them. Very potent stuff, might I add. I personally love music that tells a story, or music which I gave a story, animatics, AMB, etc. That's why I'm into musicals like Hamilton, for example. I met Melanie Martinez because a friend asked me to watch K-12 when it was about to come out. So I started hearing their music, and I fell in love with the way Mel told a story without being a musical. The Crybaby album and K-12 were a, like a dream for me, plus I related way too hard to her music, which was just a big mix of meaning and story that made me fall in love with their music. Now with Portals, I'm having a harder time to fall for the music. I like Portals, don't get me wrong, but I always end up skipping songs halfway in. But the whole aesthetic, the melodies, her passion in the craft, the way it all connects to the Crybaby lore and my love for Mel is making me hear and hear Portals again and again. 
I just love her voice. Bittersweet Tragedy was sung so beautifully and I absolutely love the sound of her real raw voice. This is the main reason as to why I don't like Portals. The auto-tune in the production is out of control and you can't hear what she sounds like. I understand that she's going for the creepy weird vibe and it's on purpose, but I just don't like it. I really miss the old looks with her iconic split dyed hair and raspy voice. I love her aesthetics and fashions from all eras, probably more so than her music because there are songs that aren't for me, but all the looks and visuals hit. When I discovered her music, I fell in love immediately. I love the idea of eerie music attached to metaphors that have deeper meaning to the reality of our world. Melody writes her music that I've never seen before in an artist and she isn't afraid of what people will think when released. I was also in a time period where I was an outcast, a weirdo because I saw the world differently than any of my peers. I always struggle to identify which emotion I should feel or if I can even feel them. Her first album describes most of my life experiences and I'm forever grateful Melody created such a piece of art that I can connect to on a deep level. I felt heard without the use of any words and realized it's okay to feel what I do even if I can't correctly identify it. K-12 was an even bigger picture for me, especially Teacher's Pet, which I'm glad she spoke on this matter as the high school I attended had these situations going on more so that two staff members were caught and nothing was done about it as students can create scenarios just to get rid of the teacher they don't like. Who knows how many times teachers went without getting caught. Songs like Strawberry Shortcake and HSS also shaped up my standards for relationships as your worth is a first above anyone else's. Don't let others pull you string by string and have them stab you in the end losing yourself in the process. Lastly, Portals is beyond my favorite album of them all. Melody re reveals herself as a whole, how much growth she's had as an artist and as a person. I'm so proud of her that she was just a young artist that no one wanted to listen to. She had a vision and made it happen. This album outshines Crybaby for me, bringing up the afterlife as the final stage of the story, in my beliefs, was a great move. It allows people to think to themselves that there's more than just, you're dead, and that's it. Makes you wonder what your own past lives were about, and if this is your final lifetime, it is for me. Or if there is more to come, we will all continue to grow even after death. For that is why I am and will always be a fan of Melanie. that people don't really like Melody Martinez material. A lot of the criticism comes down to this childlike aesthetic she's going for that has been labeled as creepy, seeing it as exploiting childhood trauma and sexualizing minors. One example is the training wheel song that compares losing your virginity to taking off the training wheels of a bike. I get what it means, but I don't want to think about it in that way. Her lyrics have been seen as over-exaggerated, not making much sense, and many question if she's ever experienced the K-12. Her standing up against the haters songs have been seen as unlikable. When she's in agony, they feel like it too. They don't like feeling that way as it's uncomfortable to them. Some of the instrumentals clash awkwardly with each other. It feels a little disjointed alongside with Martina's performance. Just doesn't feel right and off kilter. It seems like she isn't writing the rhythm properly sometimes. I can't blame her. It's hard to do so, especially when you're going through this kind of artistic vision. As I've said before, whether all this is done on purpose, doesn't matter that much to the listener. You can appreciate art, even if you don't feel like you're gonna listen to it again. Another issue people have with her is allegedly ripping off Bjork. I'm not gonna pretend I know who she is, but I know she's a respected artist and Martinez is a fan. When it comes to influences, I don't dock off points for taking inspiration as borrowing is natural in music. You'd have to be blatantly ripping someone off for me to even care. In this case, Bjork put out an album last year called Fossera, featuring herself as some type of mutation or creature. On Portals, Melanie is going for some type of fairy concept. Apparently there's been plans for this concept since 2017, with several hints leading up until now. I'm not sure if Bjork has said anything about it, but it's just another reason people don't like her as possibly copying someone's concept will lose you respect. I personally don't see it, except the ode to mushrooms, that's pretty similar. But the primary reason people would be hesitant on supporting her is the abuse allegations. If you don't want to hear this, I'd skip over. Tinefi Heller was once a friend of Melanie Martinez until Heller announced on Twitter, December 4th, 2017, that Martinez had allegedly sexually assaulted and raped her. Obviously not having a bigger platform, Heller would be attacked by 
her fans. Melanie has responded a few times. The day after this came out, she said that she was saddened by the allegations and that Heller never said no to what they chose to do together. This confirms the relationship. A second statement is put out thanking her fandom for ignoring Heller's claims and said, I would never be intimate with someone without their absolute consent. Tim Maffey said that her response says it all. First, I said no many times, but even if I didn't, it doesn't mean I wanted to. Martinez has used this situation as inspiration for Piggyback, exclusively submitted to her SoundCloud weeks later. The song speaks about the fake friends Melanie has had throughout her life and mentions how they used her fame just to steal her fans or get attention. It was pretty obvious who it was about. The Battle of the Larnex from Portals might have also been about the incident too. When it comes to these she said this, she said that situations, it's hard to take aside. Obviously if you're a fan, you'll likely stand with Melanie. If not, you'd be more inclined to support Heller. I doubt we'll ever find a true answer no matter how hard we look into the story. This never went to court. It's been nearly six years since it's happened. It was pretty much forgotten by the general public and Heller still gets hate to this day. There is no proof that Melanie did it or that Heller is lying and we will never know. All I'll say is, don't attack Heller, but also be cautious on whose side you take. I remain neutral for that reason, as I wasn't there and there isn't proof to make a claim. You're free to choose a side, it just isn't my place. Thank you for watching this video, I worked pretty damn hard on this and would appreciate a like and subscription, whether you hate or enjoy your music. I think we can all agree that Melanie is a fairly creative artist that uses each song to tell a story. She's created a whole world through her music, and I find that to be extremely respectable. After K-12, it appears Crybaby's physical body has died for unknown reasons as of now. This fascinating story will continue, and you know, I'm gonna follow along and see how it turns out. I may not be into the music, but I love the story being told. Peace.